So I think the last time I was in this space, I was 18, but <laughs> let's try and forget that for a moment. Um, anyway, thank you to Carol and everyone uh, for inviting me to be part of an Amherst experience. It's really wonderful to come back to the Red Pit and think about the wonderful professors uh, that I had in this room, including Stanley Rabinowitz uh, and Austin Sarrett and many people who left a big mark uh, on my education. So, uh, it's fabulous to see so many people who are interested in Russia. And I will say that in communicating with Sergei before this event, I told him that I was a little bit daunted that our topic was history and context, because nothing came after history and context of what. So we were a little bit scared and thinking, what could we do uh, that would be relevant for you, but not try the impossible feat of compressing millennia of Russian history uh, into two 20-minute presentations. So what we've decided is to sort of split up and talk about some of our favorite things. And as a political scientist, I'm going to talk about the Khrushchev period, and our historian will talk to you about Putin. So you will get a well-rounded uh, set of presentations. So what I'm going to do today is draw on my own recent research, which is on the year 1956 in Russia. And as you'll see, I've entitled it Fraught Encounters. Uh, and if you have an association with the Soviet Union in 1956, it might be of a really fraught moment, which is when the Soviets intervene and suppress the Hungarian uprising. Uh, that's the most fraught encounter uh, with the outside world that year. But given that the Soviet bloc is no more, I decided it would be better context for talking this weekend about reformers, as Bill Taubman will do with Gorbachev, and about current uh, US-Russia relations, as uh, Dr. Cutchins will do on Saturday, to talk a little bit about the perennial issue of relations between Russians and the West, and these moments where it seems as if change might be possible. So obviously, since Peter the Great, Russian leaders have really struggled about whether and how much to open up to outside forces, both for reasons of security, but also because of concern about exposing their own subjects uh, or citizens, depending on how you'd like to see them, to some of the ideas from the West, including about how politics should be organized and what level of state control there should be over the political sphere. So I'm talking about 1956, which is my favorite year in part because it's a year of remarkable change. And this is when the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev uh, made his own first serious sojourn to the West. And he allowed uh, members of Soviet society, not everyone, but a few, to do the same. So I'm going to talk about Khrushchev's first trip to the West, his hopes and his disappointments, uh, from that trip, and then also tell you a little bit about the so-called first Soviet tourists who were members of the Soviet elite who were allowed to cruise around Europe on uh, said ship uh, in the summer of 1956 as well. So Nikita Khrushchev, as I'm sure you all know, was one of Stalin's men with decades of responsible posts behind him in Ukraine and Moscow, important role at the front during World War II. But one of his big disappointments was that he was not allowed to travel outside the Soviet Union, except for one very brief trip at the end of World War II, where he visited territory occupied by Soviet troops uh, in Eastern and Western Europe. Stalin didn't really let him out of the house much. Uh, and in fact, Stalin would let him go to meetings with uh, important people, but with the instructions that he better not say anything. And uh, so he was a bit oppressed personally, I think, by his lack of ability to travel abroad. But Stalin dies in 1953, and his heirs begin to make changes almost immediately. Uh, if you want all the details about what they did in the order, I would say don't watch The Death of Stalin. You need to, <laughs> you need to read uh, Bill's biography of Khrushchev instead. But in short, 1956 was a big year for Khrushchev. It was a time when he had really gained confidence. Uh, he made his famous secret speech in February of that year where he denounced some of Stalin's repressions. And he began to right wrongs, including this wrong that had been done to himself, the fact that he had not been allowed uh, to see the outside world. So by 1956, he'd already begun to make some trips. He'd been to Yugoslavia, China, Afghanistan, India. But you will note that these are either socialist bloc states or what we used to call the third world, right? And so to go to the West was a different and more daunting uh, task. 
And finally, he gets this great invitation where he is going to go uh, to Britain. So what can we learn from his trip that will tell us about him and maybe a little bit about how Russian leaders still sometimes see the outward world? So the first thing I would say is that he was obsessed with questions of status and etiquette. He worried about what to wear when he met the queen. A good Soviet leader does not wear a, you know, a top hat and a frock coat. That's what the bourgeoisie and all the political posters wear. So, you know, didn't want to do that. Um, he had gotten uh, a nice new four-engine plane to keep up with the West, but the designers told him it hadn't been uh, tested enough. They wouldn't let him fly it to London. So <laughs> he decided that he would go on his new naval cruiser because it was new, um, even though it made the trip obviously a lot longer. Uh, so there was that concern about uh, looking good, making a good impression, uh, and there was a huge anxiety about what the reception would be in the West. And Khrushchev, in fact, was so nervous about this that he sent his colleague, Malenkov, who had also aspired to be the new Soviet leader, but whose position was, was on the wane. Uh, in fact, Malenkov had been demoted to be in charge of electrical power ministry. So Khrushchev said, well, didn't the electrical power ministry in Britain, didn't they invite you to something? You'll go. You go and see what happens to you. And if, if it's all right, then I'll go. So Malenkov went. He survived. Uh, the press made fun of him a little bit. But, you know, it was all right. And Khrushchev decided that, you know, this, this could be done as well. So here he is upon his arrival in London. You'll recognize him as the, the balding fellow. Uh, next to him is Bulganin, who is technically the head of the Soviet state. Khrushchev is the head of the political party. Um, so they went as a tandem here, although Khrushchev certainly felt that he was the first uh, among equals. So what happened with this trip? I would say the trip showed, first of all, that Khrushchev was intensely curious about the West and also intensely judgmental. That is, that he was looking at things that were new, and he was weighing them against the Soviet experience. And this is partly because of this very deep insecurity about uh, the West. So one of my favorite examples of this is, is they, 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 so they came by boat. They have to take a train from the port uh, to get to London. And on the train, they're served lunch, which includes turtle soup. So, of course, Khrushchev never eaten turtle soup. And it sounds, it sounds repulsive. I don't want to eat it either. Um, but so you can imagine the trepidation in which they're eating this, you know, weird uh, soup. Uh, and so they try it. They bravely eat it. But they pronounce that it's very thin compared to hearty Russian soups. So here already we see the process of trying but judging uh, that goes on throughout uh, this trip. But Khrushchev on this trip is very eager to please in a way. He wants the West to fear him and like him. He has found out from Malenkov that the British are interested in nuclear power, so he brings with him one of his top nuclear scientists. This is upsetting to the secret police, who are not usually very keen on letting people who know secret things out of the country. Um, but Khrushchev really stands up for him and says, look, our scientists are proud of their work. We have to trust them. Uh, they're going to do a respectable job. So they visit a British nuclear facility. Uh, after that, they go to Oxford, where the students climb up on the walls and you know look at them and catcall and cheer. And I think you can see from the expression on Khrushchev's face that he's not sure whether to be flattered or concerned by this kind of uh, reception. Uh, two more things that I want to say about this visit and what it shows about the attitudes and expectations of the West. So the first is that Khrushchev was ostensibly seeking to promote a kind of detente. The uh, Soviet Union had recently you know, perfected uh, its nuclear uh, capability. It was working on its intercontinental missile technology. And Khrushchev spent a lot of time saying to the British, don't you see how this changes international relations, we can have peaceful coexistence because you can destroy us and we can destroy you, but we don't want war. And on the other hand, he spent a lot of time threatening them that if they didn't take him seriously, don't forget, uh, we have plenty of missiles. He famously told this to uh, Prime Minister Eden's wife over dinner, which maybe wasn't the most tactful place uh, <laughs> to make this threat. But I, again, I think it shows this, this insecurity um, that Khrushchev carried with him. And the other little tidbit I wanted to mention is that Khrushchev takes 
his 20-year-old son, Sergei, with him. It's a huge treat for Sergei. No one of the children has ever traveled abroad, um, and here he gets this chance. So when Sergei, who's the college student age, uh, goes to Oxford, there's a suggestion that he could go and do some sightseeing in the company of some English students. Uh, and he's quite excited about this, and his father says, absolutely not. It's not safe. This could be some kind of provocation. Maybe they want to kidnap you. Something terrible could happen. And so they don't do it. And Sergei, many years later in his own memoir, says, boy, by the time we went to the United States in 1959, that would have been ridiculous. We never would have felt that way. But in that moment, we were so unsure about our reception that I didn't protest when my father uh, said this to me. And then the last thing I'll say about Khrushchev is that he wasn't much used to uh, criticism. And so they meet with some members of the British Labor Party, their fellow left-wingers of a sort, uh, and one of them uh, presents them with a list of social democrats who are in prison in Eastern Europe. And Khrushchev is so incensed by this that he essentially walks out and ends the evening early. Uh, and it becomes kind of a sign for him of how hard it is to find allies in the West, that even the leftists, you know, aren't really your friends uh, and you don't know who to trust. So I would say in, in looking at Khrushchev's behavior and perceptions of this trip, I found that he was both overconfident on one hand and very insecure on the other. Uh, overconfident in part about the extent of their missile technology, which wasn't quite what he was saying, uh, but also in his uh, personal relations. So not only does he, he behave rudely with, with Eden's wife, uh, he's seated next to Winston Churchill at a dinner, and he later says in his memoirs that Churchill had aged poorly, and Churchill tells him, you know, I think out of good intentions, that people don't really like change, and he might want to go slow with some of this, you know, criticizing Stalin stuff, and Khrushchev just blows him off. He didn't come to England to get advice uh, about domestic politics, even, even from Churchill. So uh, he comes away from this trip, not with the big uh, breakthrough, maybe, that he had hoped for in finding um, some support for the idea of more peaceful coexistence. This is uh, already in the thick of the Cold War. Um, but with the sense that they survived the trip, they acquitted themselves well, uh, they can, in fact, uh, take uh, some daring steps. And for Khrushchev, this was difficult because Stalin had spent a lot of time telling his uh, close uh, subordinates you know, how they would not survive without him. And I know Bill has this fabulous quote in his book about how Stalin tells them, you're all like blind kittens, and you know, when I'm dead, you guys are going to ruin everything. You'll, you'll fall apart. And so uh, I think Khrushchev went with a little bit of that voice uh, in his ears. But having had this relatively successful trip, Khrushchev returns to the Soviet Union, and he decides that other people can be allowed to do what he did. That is, go, learn, take the best, represent the country, um, but be cautious, not fall into trouble. And so a number of other delegations and tourist groups go to Britain that summer. Uh, in my book, I write about the historian Anna Pankratova. She's the short woman there in the center watching as this... Uh, robed academic shakes hands with Fortseva, who's the one woman who ever made it into Khrushchev's uh, cabinet. And she's a very famously fierce person, as I think you can tell from this picture. Um, but with this delegation, uh, they did the things that socialist tourists should do, which includes hopefully visiting factories. Khrushchev was very disappointed that he wasn't allowed to go to a factory. Um, and in this case, they went to see some very nice looking public housing um, uh, and that's for Tseva with her daughter. So we can see the privileges of the elite as well, that she also was able to take a family member with her on her summer trip. But so in my research about 1956, I had not initially attended to write about tourism. It's not what comes to my mind when I think about the Soviet Union. But in reading newspapers and journals from that year, I found article after article, film newsreels, everything was about the first Soviet tourists. So I had to look a little deeper uh, into who these were. And essentially, this was a scheme that was got up uh, that they were going to have these cruises, luxury cruises, on the steamship Victory, which ironically was a steam liner they'd taken as reparations from the Germans, and named it Victory. 
Um, and it was for VIPs, uh, mo including model workers, uh, factory directors, politicians, ministerial types, uh, and also members of the cultural elite, writers, composers, poets, painters, and so forth. And they had the chance to go from Bulgaria to Turkey, Greece, Italy, France, Holland, and Sweden. And in my book, I write specifically about Konstantin Postovsky, that's him in the tie there, in the center, who is a well-known Soviet writer, although he's not much read uh, in the West right now. He was, his works were very much translated uh, in that time period. So in my book, I write in detail about the impressions that these generally middle-aged people had of their first encounters with the monuments of Greece, the cafes of Paris, Dutch shops, uh, and so forth. And they found plenty of things to dislike about the West, uh, mostly poverty, unemployment, and economic inequality. Uh, they particularly disliked American tourists, so that's us down there in the corner. Uh, we did not dress appropriately for our tourist experiences. And in fact, if you recall, right, so there's how the Soviet tourists dress, right? They could, they could go to a business meeting immediately afterwards. Um, and there's the American bumpkins um, strolling. So they thought the West was vulgar and consumerists. They thought that uh, there was not respect for the working man. But they also found things to inspire them and admire, uh, most notably in the range of what I would call everyday technology. Folding wheelchairs, bicycles with baby seats. So there's a photograph that one uh, tourist took. They admired the lively street life, uh, high culture, and for most part, the curiosity and not hostility that they felt from the ordinary people they met. But their experience as tourists, I would say, is a little bit odd. It's a little bit different than what we would expect. And it also shows a little bit of this uh, lingering fear and anxiety about approaching the West. So to be one of these Soviet tourists, you had to be very carefully vetted. You had to have character recommendations. Um, you had to be instructed on how to behave and so forth. Uh, and once you started traveling, you had to stick with the group, be on time, behave yourself, you know, no drinking, no loose lips, uh, no wandering off from the group. Uh, and what I found remarkable was that you had to be an excellent observer. Every account that I read had to do with everyone had a notebook and a pencil, they had binoculars, they had cameras, they documented every stage of the trip. Uh, and hence these cartoons about, uh, about the cameras um, that were drawn by some of the people on the trip. So at first I thought, well, that's lovely. You know, this is all new for them. They don't want to forget everything. But in fact, it was because this was a busman's holiday for the intellectuals. They were supposed to encounter the West, think it through, and frame it just right for a huge domestic audience. And so articles about this trip appeared in everything from the Soviet equivalent of National Geographic to Kristyanka, the magazine for peasant women. And again there, it was kind of a puzzle to me, like, how would I feel if I were a peasant woman and I see that they're swanking around Greece, you know, and I'm at home milking the cows? Uh, isn't that sort of an odd thing uh, for a socialist state to do? But I think that ordinary people were encouraged to be proud of these tourists who were educated, uh, appreciators of high culture, who could go and be ambassadors from their country and then also translators and come back and tell people what they needed to know about the West, both the good uh, and the bad. And for writers uh, like Paustovsky, um, this trip had a really profound impact. First of all, it rekindled his love of travel. He had traveled extensively in his own country, but never in Europe. And when he wrote back, when he went back, he wrote a very powerful essay in which he urged Soviet citizens, and I'm going to give you a little quote here, it's flowery, but I think uh, important, that if you want to be true sons of your country and the whole earth, people of knowledge and spiritual freedom, people of bravery and humanity, of labor and struggle, people creating spiritual values, then you must be true to the muse of distant journeys, and you must travel to the extent of your strength and your free time. For every journey is an entry into the realm of the meaningful and the beautiful. <laughs> 
Now, for people from an open society, we kind of expect that travel is enriching. But Paustovsky is writing this three years after the anti-cosmopolitan campaign, in which people went to jail for praising Western technology. And it was considered, you know, a big detriment to have ties from overseas. So I concluded that ultimately that these tourists, in a way, were also signaling. They were signaling that things had changed, that Soviet citizens could now be trusted to not fall over themselves about the West, but selectively appraise it, take what was good uh, and leave what was bad. But I would say that there's another side effect of travel and one that perhaps Khrushchev didn't really anticipate. And that is that when you travel, you also sometimes learn things about yourself and you come to see yourself differently. So Paustovsky, this writer, uh, comes back to Russia, and in the fall of 1956, he's at a discussion of a new novel that has come out with a strong anti-bureaucratic theme. And Paustovsky uh, makes a semi-spontaneous speech in which he talks about the political bigwigs and the managers that he met while he was on this cruise. And he essentially says, these people are awful, and they should not be allowed to travel abroad because they're still Stalinists. So he doesn't flat out say that they're Stalinists, but he tells a story that's very illustrative. He says, at one point, I was leaning over the rail of the boat with my fellow writer, and we were admiring the Aegean Sea and saying how beautiful the aquamarine colors of the water were. And next to us, these two hacks uh, overheard us, and one of them says, so what, the water back home is not so beautiful as this? And the other one says, this comrade should be investigated. That's really not funny, right? Even in 1956, after the secret speech. And so Khrushchev, uh, Khrushchev, Postovsky says, these people are viscerally hostile uh, and they don't want to learn. And that's the opposite of how he imagines the good cultured Soviet citizen. So this travel experience for him gave him a certain amount of controlled freedom, but I think it also reinforced to him, too, how controlled that was, that he visited Paris, but he couldn't just wander off and meet with French writers who were his peers. He had to stick with his collective uh, and so forth. So just to make a little connection about why is this good context for today. Uh, well, today, Russians are relatively free to travel outside their borders. It doesn't depend so much on their strength and free time anymore. It depends on whether they can afford it, uh, to be honest. Um, but once again, I think they're being propagandized to be fearful of what their reception is like in the West. They get very mixed messages about whether the West is friendly and accessible or hostile and prejudiced. And they're warned uh, by their leaders and also by some intellectuals that they shouldn't be trying to imitate or learn from the West but in fact should be preserving their own path. So uh, this tension is one that continues, but uh, just as after 1956, one couldn't quite put the genie back in the bottle, I think that nowadays, uh, given changes in technology, we'll never have the extent of disconnect and ignorance about each other uh, that we used to have. And that said, I think it's not surprising that the way we punish Putin and his cronies today is by depriving them of their ability to travel in the West. That's what sanctions are really about. Who can't come here and also whose money cannot come here. So things that began to flow uh, in the 1990s, we're now trying uh, to control a little bit more. Um, that said, I think it's good that the doors are still open for people of the tourist persuasion, and it gives me a little bit of hope uh, that we will at least occasionally understand each other. All right, thank you. Yes. Um, all right, it works. Um, well, uh, good day. Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor uh, to be talking to you today. Honestly, like Kelly, I was a little bit confused initially by the idea that we, ha we have to talk in 15, 20 minutes about historical and political context of Russia. And I personally was tempted to actually um, tell you the story that the first scientific paper in the Russian language was written about the mammoth um, in the 18th... <laughs> in the 18th century, Vasily Tatishev, 
who is also known for establishing the boundary of Europe along the Ural Mountains, proved definitely and beyond any reasonable doubt that these remnants that, that, that uh, uh, were found in the ground do not belong to a giant underground rat, uh, but rather to an, ele- to an animal morphologically similar to an elephant. Um, but um, obviously, um, this story has only so much of an appeal, a broad appeal, so I decided to talk about another arcane topic, which is the rise of Putinism. Um, and again, a couple of years ago, um, uh, uh, Professor Sipel and myself who participated in a uh, colloquium which was dedicated to teaching Putinism in liberal arts colleges. And first I thought, well, I'm a historian, we predict the past, not the present or the future. What can I say about Putinism? Uh, But then I asked myself, well, if I had to write a prehistory of history of Putinism, how would it look like? What are some of the most important structural elements that led to the rise of uh, the regime in contemporary Russia that we see today? And it proved to be an interesting exercise. Um, One of the results of it is actually a course that I am teaching more or less regularly now, and it's called The Last Russian Revolution. It begins in the late uh, Soviet period and uh, brings the student to today. In this way, we can actually understand the arc of developments and see whether um, what happened in Russia in the beginning of the, 20, oh, of the 21st century um, was um, or was not um, avoidable. So I think the beginning of this big long-term social history should be sought in the Soviet period in the second half of the 20th century. As Vladislav Zubok, our colleague, has uh, shown, uh, the de-Stalinization of the Soviet Union was as much a social as it was a political phenomenon. In the context of the Cold War, the dramatic expansion of the Soviet military-industrial complex led to the development of the new Soviet class, the ITR, as they are called in Russian, Ingenierno-Technicheskie Robotniki, the engineering and technical uh, intelligentsia. Um, so the, we can call this group provisionally and with a lot of caveats uh, a Soviet middle class. Raised on Marxist ideas, it shared the belief in the power of science and technical progress, consumed Soviet culture on the edge of permissible, or sometimes impermissible, uh, listened to Western and Soviet anti-official or semi-official music, and avidly read some is that. Neither in direct opposition to the Soviet rule, nor in full ideological commitment to it, the Soviet middle class did not experience many of the Western intellectual revolutions of the 1960s, especially the critique of the Enlightenment um, that comes um, in the 1960s and 70s. So it subscribed to the Soviet notions of progressorship and was characterized by a very essentialist understanding of human collectivities, like nations, a conservative vision of culture, and biologized view of gender. And there is a reason, actually, why in, in Putin's regime gender politics plays such an important role, and I hope Professor Sipella will be talking about that um, uh, later on. It was exactly this class that became the driving force of Soviet democratization in the 1880s. It enthusiastically responded to Gorbachev and became disillusioned with the Soviet uh, framework fairly early on. And I think one of the great contributions of uh, Bill Taubman's uh, biography of Gorbachev is that it actually shows how much Gorbachev is not just a unique individual, but a representative of a larger, really tectonic shift in, in Soviet society with the rise of this new class. The Russian intellectuals today bemoan the um, apolitical stance of of the population and sort of political demobilization. Um, It is worth remembering, though, that in the late 1980s, Soviet urban class led rapid self-organization around progressive or nationalist sentiment and uh, translated it into participatory politics. Soviet urbanites lined up in queues to buy the most recent progressive magazines and gathered million-strong crowds in support of Baltic independence in Moscow. There was a demonstration in Moscow, for example, that gathered 900,000 people, and the goal of it was actually to support the independence of Lithuania, Latvia, and uh, Estonia. It's unimaginable to think that this was uh, today that this was actually happening. But the very success of democratic politics proved to be its undoing. We don't have much space here to discuss the peculiarity of of the Russian post-Soviet economic reform, but I think uh, a couple of things need to be um, uh, pointed out. The idea central to this 
post-Soviet reforms, rapid trans transition to market economy, known as shock therapy, liberalization of prices and trade, and rapid privatization proved to be very important and had fundamental political consequences for the emergence of Putinism later on. Fearful of the possible return of communists, the engineers of Russian economic reforms insisted on massive and cheap transfer of the national economy into the private hands in the hope and this is very important, that it would create a class of property owners invested in the democratic transformation. The overall result of these reforms, though, was a massive contraction of GDP, by some accounts by 50%, collapse of the welfare provisions of the Soviet era, staggering drop in life expectancy, especially in life expectancy, by some estimates 20 years of, uh, in the lives of males, um, and most importantly, I think crucially, really, for understanding the socioeconomic history of the late Soviet, early post-Soviet period, the erosion of the economic and social base of the former Soviet middle class. By 1996, which is the key year for many, re for many reasons for understanding the emergence of Putinism, Yeltsin's presidency was facing a staggeringly low 3% approval rating and the virtual disappearance of its social base. Uh, despite the broad national consensus, based as it, it is in lived experience, that the economic policies of the 1990s had disastrous social consequences, um, Russian liberals continued to defend them in the face of the obvious, providing Putin's regime with one of its most valuable tools, the negative support of the broad segments um, of population fearful of the return of this destructive uh, policy. So I want to stress again in one line the historical trajectory of the Soviet middle class created by the context of the Cold War competition and destroyed by the triumph of the neoliberal version of capitalism constituted as, uh, which constituted kind of this core threat, one core threat in the emergence of Putinism. They had it in the late 1980s, this broad segment of population invested in democratic reform and it was gone as a socio-economic socio phenomenon by the end of the 1990s. The second core threat in the history of Putinism, or prehistory of Putinism, um, as a historical phenomenon, lies in the realm of political economy of the late Yeltsin and early Putin's regime. The conundrum, this, this challenge of the disappearing social base of democratic politics, was resolved by Yeltsin's supporters in a series of interrelated measures, which, with the wisdom of the hindsight, appear as a coordinated attempt to curb popular representation. Right? Uh, let me explain this. These measures include the dispersal of the parliament in a conflict in 1993, the rapid distribution of the national wealth to politically connected businessmen in the hope of, uh, of, of, of support for uh, the presidency, and the manipulation of the presidential elections of 1996, which really set the precedent for much of what we see in uh, the Putin's period um, in terms of the electoral politics. As one colleague in Russia recently called uh, Putin's elections, an event of an electoral type. Uh, we can no longer, we can not, it doesn't actually mean that they're completely meaningless, we can talk about that later, but they're definitely not elections anymore. But the first time we see this kind of electoral politics is in 1996. As the popular discontent regarding the economic policies of the government mounted, the conflict between the president, um, the presidency, and the deputies was resolved by force, New constitution was pushed through with, with um, superpowers for the president, um, we, and it was promoted really as a means to curb the, what was called back then, the red-brown threat, uh, an imagined sort of a much taunted return of the communists um, in alliance with nationalists. The constitution created the basis for an authoritarian regime in 1993, in which alternative centers of power, such as the Federation Council um, or, of the state, or the state Duma enjoyed influence but could easily be dismissed or um, superseded by the executive authority. What I also find remarkably curious um, is that Sergei Shahrai and other authors of that constitution, liberals and Democrats with um, really good credentials, at the time argued that a strong presidential authority was required 
to push through difficult and unpopular reforms. It is now a completely forgotten fact that in 1993, these liberal authors of the Russian constitution were completely infatuated with the Chilean dictator, Augusto Pinochet. There was actually a delegation of Russians going to Chile and uh, sort of to study the economic reforms under Pinochet. And so they really saw the dictatorial powers of the president as a guarantee against possible pushback or po popular pushback uh, against their socioeconomic politics. So what were these uh, unpopular decisions that the president had to push through? Of course, the central of them was the shady and opaque privatization in the second half of the 1990s, which transferred in exchange for political support of the presidency the bulk of the national economy into private hands. Much has been written about Putin's conflict with the oligarchs, but I think we have to know that although some individual businessmen like Gusinski or Berezovsky suffered persecution and exile, at no point in its history did Putin's regime raise the idea of revisiting the sale of the century. Following the privatization of the 1990s, Russia emerged as a country with one of the greatest levels of inequality in the world, with a hundred or so individuals controlling the bulk of the economy. The super-presidential republic of Yeltsin continued to guard the new regimes of property throughout Putin's years. Putin inherited this regime and he never changed it. Even during the conflicts between Putin um, on the one hand and Berezovsky, Gusinsky, or Khodorkovsky on the other, the sort of best-known oligarchs, the issue of re-evaluating the privatization was never raised, and the political economic outcome of the privatization placed the holders of property in a subservient relationship to the personalized state, while the, lat the, the latter continues to guarantee the legacy of state auctioneering. The role of late Yeltsinism and Putinism as the guardians of the new socioeconomic order requires more research, obviously, and discussion, but it is clearly a, a central element up, upon which rests the power of Russian authoritarianism. There is a reason why the Russian state continuously fails to defend and promote small and middle business, while the enormous concentration of property under indirect state control ensures that no alternative sources of political mobilization can emerge. The third and the last threat um, in the rise of Putinism, which I'd like to discuss, can be termed the postmodern demobilization. It's a kind of a catchphrase that uh, I want to use, but I'll explain what it means. We are all familiar with this peculiar aspects of contemporary Russian regimes' use of the flows of information. Bewildering combination of ideas, conspiracy theories which often contradict each other, um, images that are sometimes clearly fabricated, um, the full subjugation of politics to the TV transmitted picture characterize the political technology of Putin's rule. The architects of this information state, or disinformation state, however you want, want to call it, are Vladislav Surkov and Oleg Pavlovsky, um, one of which, Vladislav Surkov, is still very much part of, of uh, Putin's circle of power, and Oleg Pavlovsky became, became now really an opposition figure, with their newfound commitment to a postmodern primacy of the text in the 1990s managed to create a realm in which any verification is impossible. They really, and this is extremely important to understand about Russian information campaign, they do not argue that the Russian state or Putin or anyone is right. What they argue instead, of course, is that no one is right and that the multitude of versions of truth is a normal state of affairs. These spin masters actually merit late Soviet cynicism, sort of disengagement from politics, critical stance with the state, lack of belief in anything that comes from TV or, or newspapers, um, with um, Western political technologies, especially for electoral purposes. The resulting cacophony of lies and semi-lies cannot be checked by any developed um, uh, expert-based or professional discourse on politics and history in Russia, as the collapse of professional communities in social sciences and humanities over there is almost complete. As we now know, the spread of plagiarism is, is really a kind of cancer that has eaten um, the, what remained of professional communities. An ordinary, today, an ordinary educated Russian is treated to a diet of fascist classics, neo-Stalinist fantasies, fake barrier diaries. Um, you can actually buy a fake two-volume diary of Lavrenti Beria, Stalin's associate in Moscow, and it's published by a guy who's 
pseudonym is uh, Sergei Kremlev. Kreml is the Russian word for Kremlin. Um, uh, so, um, um, you know, in practicality, in pra practically any bookstore in the country, with the exception of a dozen or, or so intellectual bookstores nationwide, um, uh, sell this kind of material. It's actually amazing to see, you know, late Soviet citizens were treated to classics, to things that passed censorship, but very often they were kind of uh, still within the tradition of the Enlightenment, let's put it this way. What we, use, we see today, sort of screaming from the shelves of, of um, uh, the Russian bookstores, are incredible, th there are really incredible texts that should be on the, mar you know, on the margins of, of uh, culture, but they have come to be at the very center. The three sources of Putinism, which um, I, I underline, the collapse of the Soviet middle class in the reforms of the 1990s, the emergence of the super-presidential republic serving as the guarantee of the new socio-economic order, and the postmodern destabilization of the regime of truth without an accompanying public commentary rooted in expertise and discussion by a professional community of scholars continue to inform Putinism and empower it. It continues to inform its constant adaptation to changing political and economic situation. They contribute powerfully to the political demobilization as well, um, and any political self-organization in Russia remains highly local today. Now, just to be a little bit on the positive side, I want to say that the cycle uh, sometimes works against uh, Putin's regime. The same way that the Soviet military industrial complex backfired on the Soviet Union with the emergen emergence of the Soviet Putin middle class, Putin's restoration of Russia's economic life um, in the early 20th century led to the emergence of a new middle class. It's still there. Um, and it's growing dissatisfied. And the success of the campaign of Alexei Navalny, who's sort of the leader of the opposition movement, primarily focusing on, on corruption issues, I think is very telling. Something is brewing um, um, at the level of sort of horizontal connections between different parts of the country, and hopefully we will see some political change. Okay, thank you very much. What they share, in my view, and I'm less informed on American politics, frankly, than I am on, on, on Russian politics. So can maybe go back to the mic? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what, what I think Putin and Trump share and, and use in a very interesting way is uh, sort of the political writing of resentment. They sense resentment. They can articulate the socio-economic and political resentment in a way that appeals to significant pro uh, segments of the population, right? They're kind of new populists. It's just that Putin has been doing it for a long time, much longer than Trump, and I hope I'm not going to insult the uh, American audience. I think Putin is way more efficient than probably... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stop there. Uh, how many decades do you think it might take for Russia to evolve into a democracy, the rule of law, or is there something in the Russian national character that will make that not decades but centuries? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't believe in any DNA that makes you undemocratic. Um, things have a reason. Right? What I was trying to argue is that Putinism is a historically constituted phenomenon. There is nothing in the DNA that contributes to uh, this particular constellation of historical factors. How long it will take? Uh, I predict the past, not the future. I'm a historian. <laughs> Many colorful stories about um, 
Putin and the other high officials in government uh, shaking down, fleecing, or in other corrupt ways <coughs> the oligarchs and the <coughs> sources of wealth and power. It has been said to me, and I have no idea if there's any basis in this, that he threw Khodorkovsky in jail and then told every oligarch that he wanted half of their company. What can you tell us about that? What's truth? What isn't truth? How does this work? Yeah. I, we've all heard, I'm sure, people say that Putin's the wealthiest man in the world. Right. There is as much evidence for it as there is against it. So, unfortunately, we don't know for sure. What we know, the facts are that, for example, one of Russia's largest oil companies, Sorgut Nefty Gas, has a, a, a secret ownership. We don't know who owns it, right? Um, and that, that's a reason why they never went for an IPO, for example. Um, we know that one of Putin's uh, childhood friends who plays a violin in St. Petersburg, he's a professional musician, um, has a, a fortune of, of about $2 billion hidden in offshore accounts. Uh, he has never been engaged in any business that we know of. Um, he, is, he plays violin. I love violinists, I have nothing against violinists, but I think what, what, what is probably the fact is that a lot of national wealth is siphoned off in offshore accounts and various sort of hidden properties all over the world, and we probably at some point historically will learn more about it, but not now. Yeah. So no idea. Sorry? Really no idea. They've done such a good job of concealing this. Well, you know, when... Yeah, I'm not an expert. I, I don't trace people's money. Um, I study history, but to me, it's evident that there is a a a. Um, I don't even want to call it corruption because it has become part of the functioning of the political uh, uh, of of the state, essentially, right? And this siphoning off of the national wealth continues um, through sometimes openly, like for example with Rotenberg brothers, who are close friends of Putin and who in the last decade and a half emerged as billionaires, dollar billionaires. Um, you know, it happened in the, in the course of one decade with no particular product con conquering the world that, that their companies produce. So I think the answer is obvious, right? Unfortunately, there is no, we cannot put a, a document on the table that shows that Putin owes, I don't know how much money. But we can say for sure that he's presiding over a system of corruption that is siphoning off the national wealth. Karen Dawisha, who, who uh, was a political scientist at the University, um, uh, Miami University of Ohio, wrote an excellent book, Putin's Cryptocracy, which traced some of these connections fairly well. She sadly passed away several days ago, which is a great loss, but the book is excellent. Um, so if anyone is interested, I, I highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the role of the, the industrial and technical class. I'm wondering if this dissolution of truth or this the scrambling of truth has affected both the operation as we're seeing undermining of science here, but also just a general demoralization of that of those activities. What do you mean by, by operation? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, so for example, are they, um, is one of the things that has happened, you know, and it started in the, uh, you know, the, in the Soviet era, of your industrial, you know, strong industrial development, strong technological development, trying to keep up with the West. And is that being undermined in the same way as the political culture? And if so, does that have ripple mm -hmm. effects mm -hmm. that might, um, you know, might cause some troubles for, for Putin down, mm -hmm. down the road? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't have the answer to that. Frankly, I'm actually surprised, uh, given the state of, of Russia in the 1990s, I'm surprised by the survival of the military industrial complex. I have no explanation how it happened. Somewhat of a miracle, uh, given that about a million scientists immigrated from the former Soviet Union um, following the breakup of the USSR. At Russia's research institutes, you would see people who are in their 70s, and you'd see graduate students coming up. Everything in the middle is gone. Um, and so given the state of affairs, I'm kind of surprised that you know this is happening. Maybe yeah. you can want to say I'm actually going to jump in on that one as well. I think that a good example of what's uh, different now between the Soviet period for the technical intelligentsia 
is the possibility to work abroad. So the scientists that I study in 1956, it was a challenge for them to even obtain books and journals from abroad. But in the 90s, all of this changed, and you have a tremendous brain drain. So some of the scientists that I wrote about who were young in 1956, they still are active researchers in Moscow, but that's partly because there's a missing generation. Um, and as for what it means for science, I think the best place to look is at Skolkovo. So Skolkovo was supposed to be the Russian Silicon Valley. But let's just start with the fact that unlike Silicon Valley, which arose in a garage near a great university, Skolkovo was planned by the president of Russia and built in a field outside the city. So these two things are never going to be the same, right? It's a totally different approach to science and technology. And I don't think it's a very attractive model. There are some fellows that won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry a couple years ago, two Russian nationals. One was working in Scotland, I think, and one was working in Belgium. They were interviewed by the Moscow Times, and they said, well, would you think you'll go back to, to Russia now? And if they were Chinese scientists, that would be very logical. China would build them fabulous laboratories and shower them with money and so forth. But these scientists said no, because science is international, and you can't be international in Russia. And one of them said that he would only go back if there were reincarnation. <laughs> you had suggested that the counterproductivity of the sanctions that have been put on travel uh, and, and the fact that, that some of the same problems that, that emerged in the Khrushchev period uh, are, can reemerge now. And I just wondered if you had the same view of, of the, uh, that the sanctions were not really uh, effective in doing uh, some of the things that they were intended to do. Yeah, actually, I don't think that the sanctions are entirely ineffective because I think it is a blow if you're an oligarch and you own property in Florida or you have a yacht you know, in the Mediterranean and now you cannot go and visit your toys and your money. I mean, they're not expropriated from you, but you are, you are separated. <laughs> well, you know, the lists get longer all the time, and there seem to be plenty more people that you can always add on to them. But that doesn't mean that they're going to achieve what they're meant to achieve. So. Um, I think these are excellent points. I just want to point out that the sanctions on Cuba have been in place for half a century. Um, I think that... That would be my answer. Uh, the problem right now connected with travel, I think, is the is the rapid disintegration of the consular services in, in Russia for uh, the US and in the US for Russia due to these expulsions. The waiting list for an interview for an American visa in Russia now is 250 days. It seems to me that in the period between Gorbachev and Putin, the West treated Russia in a very insensitive way. In other words, we, we tended, we rammed shock therapy down their throat. We kind of, you know, criticized them. To me, I, I wonder if our leadership had tried in more <laughs> sensitive ways, said, you know, you are a wonderful culture, you're a very old and powerful and brilliant country, we know you're going through problems, could we have done anything to sort of ease this thing and perhaps avoided Putin, who now tries to demonize us continually and, and gets political uh, hay out of it? Well, I would say that, uh, although I don't really necessarily feel that we should cater to the full extent of Russia's hurt feelings uh, about the West. I mean, we may have suggested shock therapy, but the system they had had failed. So they had, they had to do something. Um, but that said, there's a wonderful book about a different year, and that's Mary Elise Surratt's book about 1989, in which she suggests that in that rapidity of transition in the international system, that we were too quick to stick with the prefabricated security architecture that we had. Um, and the biggest thing there was the preservation of NATO, that that would have been a moment to rethink NATO. And I'm not sure that Gorbachev's uh, common European home had that much traction among European potential allies, but she suggests that that was a moment in which things could have turned out differently, um, but that that moment is not likely to come back anytime soon, and, and I agree with her, sadly. Last question? What, what do you think of the, of the Russian argument that they deserve a lot more respect than they get? Uh, after all, they saved Europe twice, you know, first during the Napoleonic Wars, 
and secondly, during the you know the the rise of Nazism during uh, you know uh, <coughs> Hitler and World War II, and you know you could the Russians could argue that they suffered a lot more than other countries. Um, I don't know if the Americans is the right um, you know source for this, but according to them, they lost 27 million people during World War II. So don't they have an argument that they actually deserve a lot more? respect than they get, and if they don't get that respect, why not? <laughs> you first. Um, well, there are a lot of narratives of victimization, right? And, and, and World War II ended many, many, many years ago by now. Um, and sort of the invocation of World War II is a political project of Putin's regime. Um, there are this, for example, there is this movement in Russia called the Immortal Regiment, which was started by democratic activists in a provincial town. On May 9th, um, you know, people would walk the streets with the portraits of their fallen relatives, uh, relatives who were lost in World uh, War II. Uh, very quickly, you could see how, you know, in, in a couple of years, the regime actually jumped onto this movement and Putin joined the demonstrations, carrying the portrait of his father who fought in the war. And in no time, it became a state-sponsored project, uh, which also was kind of written into this narrative of besieged fortress, everyone is against us, we made the sacrifices in World War II, you know, and now everyone is supporting all this, you know, neo-fascists, and uh, so it can become rapidly, rapidly uh, 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 used by by the regime itself. I'm not sure the, the the you know the argument that they deserve some particular specific you know respect for World War Two. Spe you know, the veterans, people who fought in it, yes, of course, but I'm not sure what's the claim of Putin's regime on the legacy, uh, you know, of of, of the victory. Yeah. And I'll just say here that this is when you get into the difficulties of Russian history because the memory of World War II is a great one for legitimating a strong central state with a strong military. Uh, but it's Stalin who was the leader during World War II. So if you make World War II your touchstone, you know, what do you do about Stalin? And it has led really to the growth in this narrative that Stalin was necessary, that the repressions, collectivization, industrialization, that this was a necessary price to pay. Uh, and the bookstores, as Sergei mentioned, are full of these just unbelievably rubbishy books, you know, with no footnotes, uh, you know, claiming all sorts of things about Stalin. Um, and so if you're looking for some signs of a narrative that would support democracy uh, or valuing the individual life, it's kind of hard to find that in the experience of World War II. So respect for the veterans, uh, respect for the sacrifice, absolutely. But I don't know that it's a model period, really, uh, when, you, when you scratch below the surface. Thank you both so much.